All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome back Rosalind Creasy again, who's uh, happy to do a, another webinar presentation for us. Um, Rosalind Creasy is a, a, an SSC board member. She's been involved in the Seed Savers Exchange since the 1980s. Um, she's a landscape designer, uh, particularly a pioneer in edible landscaping. Uh, she's also a photographer uh, and author of many books, including The Edible Heirloom Garden and Recipes from the Garden, both of which she'll be referencing in today's presentation. Um, thanks again so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, if you have questions, uh, there is a question and answer uh, box on the right-hand side of the screen um, where you can ask questions to Roz, um, and we can answer those right away at the end, right at the, uh, the end of the presentation today. Um, thanks again for coming, and with that, I'll turn it over to, to you, Rosalind. Hi there, Grant, and hi for everybody. This is going to be fun. What I want to do is cover uh, different aspects of heirlooms. Um, I think, you know, with the catalog and the books and our newsletters and everything, we talk an awful lot about saving the seeds themselves and unusual varieties and that sort of thing. What I'd like to talk about is much more global look at them, in other words, how they fit into uh, our gardens, the, our culture, our food, and just speak to some things you probably have never heard about heirlooms before, and uh, some reasons why we really should be growing them, not just because they're lots of fun and they taste better. So let's start uh, with my experience with the seed savers. I think it was 1980, first time I met everybody. This is Kent Whaley with the kids and some of the harvest then. And uh, I started working with them because I couldn't find information on a lot of old varieties that I had heard about for years and years. Even as I was a child, my dad grew up on Long Island. And for years and years, in the 1950s and 60s, he talked about that he used to have a grow a great potato that was pink all the way through. And he didn't know why people didn't still have it. It was so much better tasting than so many of them, and it grew better in his garden. And so he, every year I can remember his frustration. He would order what were called red potatoes, and they would come with red skin on the in, in, outside and white inside. And I could hear him swear. He was really angry. He was swearing in front of his daughter. Oh, so that stuck in my mind, how important that must have been to him. And imagine my absolute amazement when I found that through the seed savers I could get potatoes called all red, and they were red all the way through. So that was kind of my introduction to seed saving years and years and years ago. All right, so I started visiting the seed savers and learning information for my book, Cooking from the Garden, and learning an awful lot of, about different varieties. And here's a um, photo from about that era of the Seed Savers Farm. We've come a long way since then. We've got the visitor center and some administration offices and so forth. But this is how we started. And you can see the isolation boxes there. That's uh, to keep uh, pollinating insects out from cross-pollinating things like peppers. And if you can imagine, these poor folks who work here on the staff, they have to get in and these sort of things on a hot, muggy day. And, and do cross-pollination by hand. But uh, anyway, it's come a long way. And one of the reasons is our people like John Withy. I met John in uh, 1980, and that's his famous bean box. And we talked about beans, and it was so exciting. We were in a restaurant, actually, when I interviewed him. And my husband later commented. He said, you know, the most animated conversation in the whole restaurant was you and John talking about beans. How ridiculous was that? <laughs> But you know, when you're passionate about these things, you're, it comes out. So I started coming out, and David Cavaniero was then the gardener and uh, in charge of their garden. And look at these amazing varieties of things he could get. And I started photographing them with him, using some of his photos when I would give presentations around the country. And I can remember people. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, when I would show these images, they would just gasp. They never had a clue that there were white tomatoes, much less fluted ones and pointed ones and so forth. So it was real eye-opening to the public because for about 25, 30 years, of course, all people were growing were round red tomatoes and uh, white potatoes, 
so forth. So um, as you can see, we have a huge, huge selection now that we are become more aware of, particularly if you're involved with the seed savers. Uh, the one that I think still, <laughs> I can show this slide and it still boggles people's mind, is just as a harvest of all the eggplants, the different kinds that we had at the seed savers one year. So you can see it's just an amazing treasure. But I'd like to talk about some other aspects of these heirlooms that aren't spoken about, actually. I don't think I hear anybody talk about it, except for me. Here we have different colors of carrots. And yes, they're interesting because they have different colors. But there is a profound difference between them as far as the nutrition is concerned. And the thing that most people don't realize is that foods go in fads just like styles of everything else. You know, in the late 1800s, people wore hoop skirts and they still pinched in the waist of women So, because the dear things, we wouldn't want them to do any work because if they did any work with a pinched waist, they'd probably pass out. So things weren't very practical and neither was the food. And one of the reasons we do evolved into the early 1900s to have a lot of foods that were white was because it was the carryover from the Victorian era. And that was all about purity. Queen Victoria wore her white dress for her wedding and that's why most people nowadays wear white dresses and it was to um, represent virginity, purity, and we don't have any of these baser thoughts. So white, white vegetables, can you believe that's when they started uh, doing things like wax beans, making white beans, we call them wax beans, and there are different varieties that were evolving in that time that were white, and of course white bread, and uh, white rice, and it just went on and on, white sugar. So just as white sugar doesn't have very much in the way of nutrition, white carrots compared to the deep red carrots on the left have a very little of the antioxidants and vitamins that we want, the carotenoids. And as a general rule, the more deeply colored your vegetables are, the more nutrition. And guess what? Most of the old heirlooms have all this big range of color, so you actually had a much wider palette of nutrition when you were eating. So you will see that an awful lot of those old varieties um, have more um, what we would call deep nutrition and the antioxidants in particular. I like to explain to people, you know, we hear the word antioxidants all the time on the um, advertisements and you see it in food packages. What is an antioxidant? An antioxidant is actually a um, molecule that goes after oxidation uh, that has ruined some of the uh, well, I'm not explaining that well. Let me start. If you have a fireplace and you put in some logs and you burn them, you end up with a lot of ashes. And the ashes is a residue from oxidation. Well, the same thing happens in your body in, in many different ways. We breathe in oxygen. We use it for energy. We take in food. We use it for energy. And these use up oxygen in different ways. And it actually destroys some of the, um, the molecules and leaves a residue and the antioxidants are these wonderful chemicals that, that uh, nature has created that, that end up and they will neutralize and get rid of the toxicity in these um, oxidants. So what we need to do on every, every day is to eat a number of antioxidants and they do different things. And I like to use some of the research that's out more recently. For instance, if we take a a chemical, uh, a, an antioxidant called lutein. It's a yellow pigment. Uh, almost all the pigments in vegetables and fruits are antioxidants. So if we take a yellow one, it's called lutein. There are many different antioxidants, there are actually hundreds. Uh, and we take lutein. Uh, basically, if we were to make it radioactive in a lab and we give it to somebody to eat, where would the lutein go in your body? Well, of course, it would go all over, but where really most of it goes is to the back of the macular in your eye. And yellow, the yellow pigment, actually absorbs ultraviolet light. So they're natural sunglasses. And so just something as innocent as eating your yellow squash or yellow watermelon, or so, just a lot of yellow vegetables have lutein in them. Uh, you are helping to prevent your eye from being damaged by ultraviolet. 
if you take another antioxidant, it's called lycopene. It's a red pigment and it's very commonly found particularly in tomatoes and in red watermelons and in red peppers, though some red peppers are different antioxidants. But the bottom line is if you were to make your um, lycopene radioactive again and give it to somebody in the lab to eat and they do um, a study afterwards and where did that lycopene go? The lycopene went, if you are a man, it went to the testes. If you are a woman, it goes to the ovaries and it prevents testicular and ovarian cancer. That is the chemical, that is what it you know does why we need to keep eating these things every day. It's why your mother, when she said, eat your vegetables, she was absolutely correct. She didn't know the basic reasons. She just knew it worked. And people who eat a lot of different vegetables are healthier as a rule. All right, so let's talk about another heirloom. Uh, the tomato brandywine is the, I call it the poster child for the heirloom movement. If people have, even that aren't gardeners have not heard of uh, heirlooms, uh, or if they have heard them, probably they've heard about a brandy wine tomato and it's held out as the tomato you have to grow. Well, you know, that's all well and good. But one of the things that doesn't come out in all these wonderful magazine articles about brandy wine and books and so forth is the fact that it only grows in very well in just specific climates, that tomatoes are extremely sensitive to pollination and the um, they need perfect conditions to pollinate properly. And for different tomatoes, that those perfect conditions are different. So uh, basically, when you have a brandywine tomato, if you look at it and you see those indentations, basically each one of those is outlining the ovary. So this particular brandywine looks like it has at least 10 ovaries. You see those 10 um, different raised areas on the top. Well, a tomato that has 10 ovaries has to have much more perfect conditions for pollination than does a single cherry tomato, for instance. So what are the conditions that that tomato wants? Brandywine evolved in the Brandywine Valley of uh, Baltimore and that region. And basically it wants to have very nice warm uh, weather it, so that we have warm at night. Uh, it doesn't go below 70 degrees, high humidity. And in the daytime, it's up in the um, high 80s, low 90s. And boy, that brandywine tomato is very happy. Now, if you go up to the Pacific Northwest, or you go down to the arid desert, neither one of those conditions have that. At nighttime, on most of the West Coast and up the East Coast, in Maine, in that area, at night, it may, you may be very lucky if it gets to be uh, 55. So you're, what happens is that the pollen grows so slowly down the tube that it dies before it is able to fertilize the fruit. So basically, this tomato, while it, it really symbolizes heirlooms, uh, it really is limited in where it can grow. So I kind of find people who come up to me and say, oh, see, I can't grow heirloom tomatoes. And you say, yes, you can. It's just you, you can't grow brandy wine or you can't grow you know, mortgage lift or some of those big ones that were evolved in very different conditions than where you live. You want to go for some of the Russian ones like or the Czechoslovakian like Stupice, uh, which some people call Stupis, um, Siberian, and there are just some others that you really, they will grow much better. Cherokee purple, um, ones that just came out of that part of the world. Anyway, so all heirlooms do not work equally in all parts of the country. And that's one of the things that the seed savers were trying to document and get together. Modern tomatoes have been bred for the whole country. They are one size fits all. And under no circumstances do they approach this luscious brandy wine. But you know, you get tomatoes and that's important to people. So the bottom line is know where your, your heirlooms, where they eat were grown and where they come from and you'll have a much better idea of whether they will grow well for you. Let's look at another aspect of heirloom vegetables. This is a squash, usually called a pumpkin, called Rouge Rutant. It's a French pumpkin and people grow it. They call it the Cinderella pumpkin and they try to make pie from it or to serve it as just 
as they would butternut squash. Well, it doesn't work for that. So people say, oh, we'll see, it's not edible. That's not true at all. You just have to look back and say, how did they serve this when it evolved in France? What did they use it for? The chefs rave about this in Paris in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They used it as a base for vegetable stock because it makes a very rich vegetable stock. It works very well for that. And they have a lot of recipes where they use it. It's just not the way we are used to. Here is a um, version of a very French version of a squash meal. Here we have a whole uh, pumpkin here, the Rue Fricton. And I've hollowed it out, and I've put in front, uh, first you start with chicken stock and leeks and garlic and onions and herbs. And then you put in Fontana cheese, and you, free, and you bake it until it just the, the pumpkin gets soft. And then you scoop out pieces of the squash with the lining and make this amazing dish that's uh, really a whole dinner with some beautiful bread and a salad. Um, and the recipes for this sort of thing, they're in my recipe book, uh, Rosalind Creasy's Cooking from the Garden. And I, it's, this one also is in the heirloom book. But the fact of the matter is we have to know how to cook with some of these things. And, and uh, we didn't know that. This is part of the research that uh, we've been doing for years and years and years. And we look at all the different colors of potatoes. And there are those all red potatoes in the front that my father lusted after and could never find. Unfortunately, he passed away before I was able to give him some. He would have been thrilled. But we have here to the right potatoes, uh, blue mechanic. It's blue on the outside and white inside, and there's the all blue potato that you've probably heard of in the top left. Lots of different colors of potatoes. So now we look at cooking up those blue potatoes, and people will say, oh, well, they turn gray, or they're just weird, and I don't know what to do with them. So we've worked our way and done some recipe development when I was working on the cookbooks. And so I made this vichyssoise. It's potato soup with onions and a very French soup again. And uh, I first time I made it, it turned gray. I was so disappointed. And then I looked at Harold McGee's book on the science of cooking. And he said, oh, well, you know, if you add some uh, lemon juice to some foods, it'll change their color, or baking soda. It's, and uh, sure enough, it's, this is like your hydrangeas. You know how you can change the color of the hydrangeas by what soil pH? Well, this is the same thing. So I put in uh, about a half teaspoon of lemon juice, and the beautiful soup appeared. I was so excited because <laughs> that other looked like wallpaper paste. It wasn't going to go very far. So again, we have to learn how to cook with all these wonderful vegetables. Here's a beet called early blood turnip. It's a very large beet. Nowadays, when you buy beets, and when you buy most vegetables in the grocery store or even at the farmer's market, it's very summer oriented. I mean, most places don't even have a, a farmer's market in the wintertime. But that's not the way our ancestors uh, gardened and cooked. They gardened not for the fresh food they ate in the summer. That was a bonus. They gardened to survive, and they had to have foods that made it through the winter. And our modern little beets would never make it in a, in a coal cellar. They would shrivel up. They would have those as just nice beet thinnings uh, in the middle of the summer. But you need the great big beets. Actually, there's some that grow to the size of volleyballs. There are carrots that are two feet long. And I have not seen those varieties offered in years, but I know they exist. I think the seed savers, uh, may, maybe a few of the people have them to trade. But the fact of the matter is these were old varieties that were grown to be stored. That was going to keep you going through that horrible time of January, February, and March. So, OK, so you say, all right, well, do I want those big beets? Or I want those, what would I do with those big carrots? Heaven forbid. So I visited a woman, uh, Deborah Friedman, at Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts. And that's the colonial village there. And she's a food anthropologist. And I asked her about them, because I've been growing some of them the big beets. And she said, oh, you have them? That's so exciting. She said, do you know what they used to do? I said, no, tell me, because I have no idea what to do with it. And she said, well, of course, they pickle them. But the most important thing they did was they would put them in the charcoal in, in the fire when they were burning 
the fire, fire in the fireplace so that when they made soup or stew or something, they would roast them. And what you do is you end up with this beautiful beet that's all covered with kind of charcoal and you knock it off and you end up with this smoky caramelized beet and it's to die for. It's fabulous. Sometime you grow these big beets, you try it. Do the same thing with the carrots, you do it with parsnips, all the root vegetables. And here's what I've done with some of them. And uh, it's just to eat the greens too, of course. But uh, another thing they did was to puree them and make them into pies. We don't think of uh, turnip pie or carrot pie, but it's absolutely delicious. And for those of you who like to eat pie for breakfast, that's part of your heritage. Uh, that was a very common breakfast food in the 1700s and early 1800s. It was going to keep you going when you had to go out and work in the fields and uh, do a lot of manual labor. And Mama could make it the night before, so she didn't have to get up at 4 a.m. to cook. All right, let's look from some other countries and see what heirlooms they have, <clears throat> they have that we can enjoy today. <clears throat> Here's lettuce in the Val de Saison, or Four Seasons Lettuce. And I planted it in my tulip bed, because the tulip bed looks pretty bare most of the year. And I've grown some old varieties of tulips. You notice this one, Color Cardinal, which is available from Old House Nursery. Old House is a wonderful a company that only carries old varieties of bulbs. They're keeping the old heirloom bulbs alive, just like the seed savers is working with the vegetables and flowers and fruits. So putting these, the, I purpose, purposely chose the shorter color cardinal because the modern tulips have been bred for flower arranging and they want them to have these stems that are 18 inches to 2 feet tall. Well, I didn't think that would fit so well with the lettuces. Secondly, they blow over if you get a storm and you've waited all year for these darn tulips and next thing you know you've gotten two days worth and the big storm comes over and there they are laying over. So a lot of the modern ones uh, just don't function very well in the garden. As I say they are for cutting flowers and the old ones not only do are they a little bit shorter but most of them repeat the next year unlike some of the modern ones. So getting back to France, of course they develop more and more melons than probably uh, any of the other European countries. They, it, the melons originated in the Middle East, but uh, the French took it and ran with it, as they say. This is the famous Charente melon. I remember going to Paris many years ago, and I became the ugly American. I started to pick up the produce, and the purveyor, she came over to me, Madame! And, uh, she figured I was American and said in English, we don't touch the produce. And it's like, oh, I'm sorry. So how are you supposed to choose it? Well, they choose it for you. And so I said I would like a melon. And she said, well, do you want to eat it in two hours? Or do you want to eat it uh, this evening? Do you want to eat it tomorrow? I said, oh, uh, for supper. She said, fine. And then she smelled some and wrapped on them. And she said, this is the one you want. That's how critical it is to pick a Chante for its peak beauty and lusciousness. Basically, you re when you grow a Chante, uh, it takes you a year or two to learn when to harvest it and how to get it at its best. If you get it too soon, it doesn't have much flavor. You get it perfect and your eyes roll up in the top of your head. And if you get it too far along, it's kind of squishy and it's, it mushes fast. So some of these things, we have to know a little bit more about it, growing them and harvesting them than we do on standard uh, vegetables that you might be growing out of another you know, modern catalog. Um, let's go to Italy. What did they do with so many of the things that we look back and say are wonderful? This woman here is, she is um, stringing small tomatoes and drying them that way. They also dry ch uh, cherry peppers. And I remember growing them years ago and thinking, well, they're, they're cute, but they're, who wants to cut them up and deal with them when I can deal with a bell pepper? And basically, I found out in, that in Italy, they have wonderful things to do with them. And uh, here's the Tuscan blue kale. And I thought I had a picture. I don't. Um, getting back to the peppers, they would stuff them 
with cheese or prosciutto or olives or mushrooms or pickled mushrooms and in, they would then dry them and in the winter time they would reconstitute them in red wine and again serve them as a first course stuffed with cheese or prosciutto and they, the Italians weave vegetables throughout the whole meal they don't see that you know they would never start with chip and dip and and uh, end up with you know a gooey dessert they would have they have their vegetables all throughout the meal they have a charred tart that's to die for um, who would think of that? And it's made with Sauterne wine. But uh, anyway, here's Tuscan uh, black kale. Some people have labeled it Tuscan blue kale. Uh, other people, they use dinosaur kale. But I think in, in Italy they refer to it to La Sonata. But this kale is incredibly nutritious and versatile in the garden. One of the things in the last 20 years that's really been awakened. I know in many of the grocery stores around the country you now see it, you, and the farmers markets and of course. So many of our vegetables we use on a daily basis came from Italy and they have developed them uh, both over the hundreds of years to make them more succulent and um, you know more edible parts to them. But here we see for instance chard which was an offshoot of beet. You see the red chard there and there are beets in the middle row here and endives and escarole and onions and broccoli those all came and parsley those are all native to the Italian peninsula and so when you want great varieties you tend, tend to look for ones in the catalogs the heirloom ones with a an Italian name to them uh, we get a lot of our heirlooms particularly the seed savers from Germany because uh, so many Germans immigrated to the United States uh, in the 1700s, early 1800s. Matter of fact, I think until 1850 or so, the largest minority in the United States were Germans. So here's a Winnestead uh, cabbage. I find it more tender and a little sweeter than the ones you would get at the markets. And why don't you usually see them? Well, you see it has that pointed top. You could never send that, you know, ship that. It would bruise the top, even, you know, in an old wagon years ago. So this was a home variety, uh, and I really recommend it. If you have not grown cabbages in a while, try this one. It, I think you'll find it um, much uh, it's tender and sweet. It's a lovely one. Uh, here's an old German lettuce. I can't pronounce my assistant's German. She can say Lüdenschluss beautifully. I can't. I call it speckled trout lettuce. And just for fun, I put this little ceramic frog in there so you could get a chuckle. I saw the frog in the in the uh, nursery, and I said, "Oh, that would be perfect with that lettuce." So there he is. And of course, there are lots of Asian varieties, old heirlooms that were brought over. Um, particularly in the 1800s, early 1900s. Pak choys, mustards, all different kinds of, uh, they have lots of different scallions. And they're just beautiful, beautiful work with greens, and pea pods, and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The red mustard in the back left there is my favorite. If you like wasabi, you will absolutely adore it. Um, it is a crunchy wasabi. You slice up the leaves and you put it in a sandwich. Uh, ham sandwich or uh, you put tuna fish or something it's just divine it gives you crunch and it gives you that punch with, the, with that spicy part of it and it uh, is just I think you'll see but it has to grow big enough uh, to have the ribs be crunchy you can't the baby sometimes you'll see it in a baby green mix and it gives a little pep peppery taste but you won't get that real punch paprika peppers uh, paprika is the Italian word for pepper, so all Hungarian peppers by definition are paprika peppers. Um, a bunch of them have been particularly selected for drying. They have thin walls, there are many different ones, hot ones, sweet ones, and let me tell you, sometimes I pass around to my audience a jar of homemade paprika and they open it up and I can see the eyebrows go up and I can see the buzz as it goes around the room. I know exactly where it is. Oh my word, it really tastes, I mean, it smells like pepper, tastes like pepper. It's not that brown dust that you buy in the store. Uh, 
grow your own, throw the can away, you'll be much happier, I guarantee it. Anyway, look to the paprika peppers. So start looking around the different nationalities, see how they work with them in their native country. Go online, search it out, but you'll find many, many different ways to cook these heirlooms than just the standard recipes that so often, and you know, I look uh, recipes online and in cookbooks and everything, and they're out of the grocery store, the vast majority of them. But you want variety, uh, you want recipes for those specific to the garden. You'll have a much wider palette. All right, let's quickly look at a few fruit trees here and uh, see where we're going. Be here at the Seed Savers, we have about 700 varieties different ones. There are hundreds, as you can see, all around the country, different types. And they have much more flavor than the modern del red delicious and yellow delicious. I'm sorry that that's become the standard apple. I don't think most people who have choices would choose that one. In the foreground here is a, photo, uh, is a cut apple from my garden. It's called Pink Pearl. You notice it's pink inside. It makes pink applesauce and a pink apple tart. Uh, and again, remember the antioxidants. I've never seen it documented, but I'm absolutely positive it has more antioxidants than a regular white uh, fleshed apple. Uh, here it is growing. I have it as a dwarf. Uh, I live in the suburbs. So here it is between my driveway and my neighbors. And I've grown another, I've uh, combined it with an iris, an old heirloom iris called Eleanor Roosevelt. It's from the 1930s. And unlike the modern irises, which only grow one time a year, uh, only bloom one time a year, this will, in my garden in California, it'll bloom at least three times, sometimes four. It just cycles every six, eight weeks. So you might want to try that. And it doesn't seem anywhere near as prone to diseases and crypts and so forth as the modern irises. Apple trees, people say, oh, it's great, but boy, you get an awful lot of apples. What are you going to do with all those apples? Well, you have a party and you make cider. And then if you want another party, you make hard cider. <laughs> and you can have a wonderful time. Uh, applesauce, of course, and, and you can dry apples and so forth. But for many people, that nice little dwarf apple, like my size, uh, in my yard, actually is perfect for family. And then you can have five, six, eight, ten different varieties and make it as a hedge and have different heirloom apples. And they have they will bear at different times of the year. Some of them will store over the winter. Some don't store at all, but are great fresh. So you know, look to the apples with more than just what you know in the grocery store by a long shot there. Just, and go to apple tastings there. You're now finding them more and more around the country. Seed Savers has a fabulous apple tasting. I don't know how many we taste, 40, 50 of them at one time. And uh, if you come here, they teach you how to make cider. and. Uh, how to graft apples. They're just the, This is a real resource. Um, plums from all over the world. They're fabulous plums. A lot of them French, like this one, the Duarte plum. Look through a lot of them from Europe, rather than some of the more ma um, modern American ones. And you'll see a range of flavors, uh, more adaptability sometimes, like the ones from uh, Northern Europe will be more adaptable to the Northern tier, and some from Southern Europe and the Mediterranean much better in the southern tier of this country. I like to use gardens full of both the flowers and the veggies. Here's my front garden years ago. And uh, one of the things you might see that's in the wheelbarrow there is a round cannonball watermelon. One of the beautiful things about watermelon, and think again, remember I was saying uh, years ago they grew foods to keep it for the winter? not for the summer eating. Watermelon weren't grown for their flesh. Nowadays, modern melons have very thin skins. That's what people want, because all they want is the flesh. But in the old days, that was fine. You know, you had a summer evening, everybody enjoyed the flesh, and then the next day, mom and grandma would work on making watermelon pickles, and you'd make it from the rind. And they're absolutely delicious. They're heavy in cloves in particular and in syrupy and they're just they're like chutney they're quite wonderful and quite versatile once you've made them i think you'll fall in love with them but it's very difficult to do it with the modern melons because they don't have enough rind to really pick them and here i'm just using both the flowers and the vegetables together in the landscape uh, i know some of you have enough room and you can make a garden all to itself and have rows of veggies and rows of cutting flowers but i have to say why 
why wouldn't you combine them? Well, you don't combine them because traditionally it's the most efficient way to run a plow down the fields is to have straight rows and you don't want the mule to step on the plants. They couldn't possibly plow this. Uh, but you know, nowadays we don't live that way. Most of us don't have that much property. How do we grow our heirlooms, our vegetables, and our flowers? And uh, you know, why can't we combine them? Well, we can. I checked in the Constitution. It doesn't say you can't combine vegetables and flowers. Damn it! Uh, so let's get past that. You want to do it not just because it gives pleasure, but the real reason you want to grow all these wonderful flowers in amongst your vegetables is because it's good horticulture. Almost all the beneficial insects, the guys that control the bad guys, need pollen and nectar to reproduce and if you don't have flowers around they go away or they die but without reproducing. For heaven's sakes, even if you don't intersperse a lot, put some flowers around the vegetable garden. It is much more efficient. When we went through our era of better living through chemistry in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you nuked everything and so you didn't worry about the bad guys so much. And then the bad guys, the, the bad insects started reproducing and they got immune to the, all the pesticides and we had to keep upping the ante until we got to the point where we're saying, what the heck are we doing here? So now we're going back to not using all those harsh chemicals. And you have to pay more attention to beneficial insects. It's critical that you have some flowers in the area. And so combining them in a small area like this patio uh, is wonderful. You notice the paprika peppers here. It's one called Bulldog, B-U-L-D-U-G. No, B-O-L-D-U-G, Bulldog. It's from Hungary. Makes a fabulous uh, paprika. Um, and think about your know, raised beds are great. Think about interspersing. Also think about involving children. This is the children's garden in Old Westbury, Connecticut. And you'll notice there's a sign there. You probably can't read it, but it says plant a row for the hungry. The Garden Writers Association, uh, GWA.org, uh, offers free seeds to anybody who wants to grow them out in quantity so that you can give them to the, to the uh, soup kitchens. They also give you a, a list. You can go on their website and show you the soup kitchens around nearest to you and what they most like. Um, so that's an in. And you also, the Seed Savers has Herman's Garden and you can get uh, free seeds for the children's garden. Um, so those are available to people, you know, uh, limited means or whether you just want to experiment with some of these things and, and spread the generosity around. And of course, a lot of reasons that we grow a lot of these old heirlooms is because they're fun. And kids, you know what? Kids love to plant white potatoes, but you see how fascinated they are because Goody, my assistant here, she's already cut a blue one and she's asking, what do you think the color of this one is? And of course, it was red. And then they go home and they say to their parents, you know there are red potatoes and blue potatoes and they bring them to school for show and tell. This is a fabulous way of involving kids. And I found after growing a, a my heirloom vegetable garden in, at the Brooklyn Botanical 25 years ago, we had, they had many more grandparents and, and aunts and uncles and friends show up in their garden because the kids were talking about purple string beans. And they were growing yellow zucchini. And they were growing white tomatoes. And everybody had to come and see it because they didn't believe the kids. And the kids walked into that garden and they just puffed up their chest and see, see, I wasn't kidding. See, they're purple string beans. They knew something parents didn't know. Anyway, have fun with heirlooms with kids. It's a wonderful way to keep it going. All right, I want to talk a little bit about flowers. I think most of us who think about seed saving, certainly, you know, we're talking about vegetables. That's gotten the most press. But you know what? We're losing a lot of our old flowers and it's getting serious, folks. I grew a, a zinnia garden a number of years ago, and look, look at all the different ones. I would say half of those are hard to get anywhere. Maybe at the seed savers they're exchanged, but you know a lot of them aren't offered anymore uh, commercially. So here's a picture of this is to show you how how this is going. This is a picture of a sunflower. Okay, I took it at the seed savers, and you notice the butterfly, you're used to seeing butterflies and bees and all sorts of insects on your sunflowers. 
Look at this one. Do you see anybody there? No. Nobody there. Notice no pollen. No pollen? What do you mean no pollen? Well, they have pollen. It's down underneath and uh, basically it's a whole different botanical story for me to tell you how they even pollinate these things. But anyway, here's the point. A lot of the modern sunflowers have been bred do not have pollen because Milady doesn't want pollen on her tablecloth or on her nose when she's sniffing the lily. So we now have all these new particularly cutting flowers uh, that have no pollen. Think about that. Think about the ramifications of that. We have a botanical desert in so much of our agricultural fields with just corn and soybeans and rice and wheat. We have a botanical, um, I call it a desert, when we have lawns, I mean sure it's green, but it's one variety of, of plant. It's not e bluegrass is not even native here, it's native to uh, Africa, even though we call it bluegrass. So what does it feed? Nothing. It, you mow it, you use a lot of resources, but it doesn't give you anything. So we as a culture effectively are saying, oh well, we don't care about nature, we're going to go on without you. Well, you know, here's a beautiful example. Do we really need all these new, we got new um, pollenless geraniums? Because some people might be allergic to it. Uh, it goes on and on. So uh, here's, here's a bouquet I cut at the seed savers a number of years ago. Look at the range. Uh, we need to keep all those going. And we need to keep all that pollen out in the garden. And we need to keep those seeds for their nutrition. Um, Here's a field I walked about 20 years ago. Uh, it was modern varieties of flowers. Well, in the trade we call these the roundy moundies. They're all, they take those zinnias and instead of having them three feet tall, we make them six or eight inches tall. We make them so they can bloom when they're in a six pack because most modern Americans when they go to the nursery they don't know what a zinnia is and they don't know it unless it's in bloom and then they don't even have to know the name they can say oh that's a pretty flower I'll grow that so the, the, the seed industry the flower industry has gone over to roundy moundies the bloom the, for the bedding plant industry and they've gone to the pollenless and the very long stems for the cutting flowers so where does that leave us well you know they're not very garden worthy if you really want an interesting garden I grew a marigold garden. Here are just some of the many varieties we have there. Uh, here's the marigold garden. Now you see in the back are all the big heirlooms, the X15s and um, wonderful big flowers in the back. And then you notice the roundy moundies in the front. Now I've mis mixed them together and I'm not saying there weren't some old varieties. Marietta is a, a dwarf um, old French variety of marigold. But the fact of the matter is um, we need them all and look at the pollen there. I had an entomologist come to my garden and he identified 18 different species of yellow jackets in my garden. I only have a quarter acre garden. That's He was just boggled. Some he hadn't seen in years. We need to attract the pollinators. I know you don't want the yellow jackets particularly, but I can't grow butterflies either because all my yellow jackets and my wasps go after all the caterpillars. I don't have the cabbage moth this this fall. I have all my cabbages and broccoli out. I'll t see little pinholes and then I'll see the little bene all the different beneficials wandering around in the leaves and the baby caterpillars all get eaten. I saved two swallowtail butterflies last week for a little neighbor friend because she wanted to grow them. And um, so we now have some swallowtail larvae, but I saved them and they were less than a quarter inch long. I know if I'd stayed out there any longer, they would have been goners. And the rest of the batch, I'm sure, had already been eaten. The fact of the matter is the beneficials will go after your caterpillars. They will go after all the bad guys that want to eat up your, your wonderful food. So plant pollinators. Here's a fabulous old... Um, old varieties of cosmos and you can see I, again I combined the new and the old uh, so you can see the difference the old ones are in the vase or at my grandmother always said vase she said if they're over fifty dollars it's a vase well that's not it's a vase uh, <laughs> anyway so uh, but a lot of the old varieties are from the uh, 
uh, Victorian era, and they had all these. Remember, we were talking about the Victorians and being so pure. Well, they sublimated all that wonderful passion, and they put it in the names of their flowers. Here's love in a mist, and here's love lies bleeding. Some of the old varieties of things. It's actually a lot of fun to grow a Victorian garden. Um, there's Marilyn Barlow, and she uh, has this wonderful seed company that has a lot of the old heirlooms uh, flowers, and it's called Select Seeds. And she's in her garden there, and behind her is Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate. So, you know, there are three plants right there with passionate names in them. Um, it's a wonderful little side, side note to history. Here's my front yard when I put in an heirloom garden, lots of heirloom flowers. Those are the beautiful signet marigolds there, the yellow ones in the background over to the right. They are fabulous, and the beneficial insects go nuts over them. Uh, it just makes a more graceful garden to have the old timers. This is my backyard with the old fashioned foxgloves. It's called apricot beauty. Look at the height on those. The modern foxgloves, so you don't have to stake them, uh, are only uh, 18 inches high. And that's an old rose. It only blooms once a year. But boy, when it does it, is it not spectacular? It stops traffic. I mean, I have people, go, oh, I remember I was in your garden. Is that rose in bloom? I want to come back and see it. Very fragrant. We don't know the name of it. It came from the Luther Burbank home. Uh, we just call it the Burbank home, uh, rose, but they know it's from the late 1800s. Here's some hollyhocks and uh, delphiniums, and I use them to block off my chicken coop in the front yard. And uh, they just give a lot of grace and charm to a garden. I sell a lot more photos, let me tell you, with a lot of these old heirlooms uh, flowers than I would if I had just the roundy moundies. So what did they do? Well, again, you know, they had to preserve these flowers, and, and uh, they didn't make frosting flowers for things in the, the winter time, for a cake or special occasion. They would candy the flowers, and here we have candied violets. Uh, you just paint the petals with egg white, and you put uh, very finely ground sugar on them, and dry them on a rack, and put them in a a, a tin that has a nice tight lid. And they will say they will keep for two, three years. And they taste like candy, and it's totally wonderful. We put them on my uh, son and daughter-in-law's uh, wedding cake. We did little roses, and when we turned the cake around, the, when they got to cut the cake, there were holes in the back because some of the kids that were at the wedding had realized that they were tasty, and they started stealing them off the back of the cake. <laughs> anyway, rose petal honey. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful um, thing. They didn't have rose water particularly for years and years, but they would uh, get the rose scent and put it over pastries uh, by flavoring the honey. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the old varieties of poultry because I have chickens. That's my grandson there. Uh, that's a photo we took at the Seed Savers when uh, we have our camp out for the third weekend in July, which always everybody needs to come to. And they had a lot of uh, varieties of old varieties of chickens. So here's a white crested back, black Polish. At home, I have uh, a cucumber on, red, a red star, and buff Orpington. So I'm helping to keep those old species, uh, old varieties of chickens alive. And the, you know, they're a lot more interactive with people than some of the modern leghorns and uh, Rhode Island reds. And uh, that's Kate across the street. That's the first time she touched a chicken. She was so excited. And she became my chicken whisperer. And when I'm out of town, she comes over and takes care of the chicken. She's now about 9 or 10. So here's Diane's garden at the Seed Savers Exchange. I took that uh, last summer. And you can see she's combined vegetables and flowers. It's a very healthy, healthy garden. And uh, we use it to demonstrate uh, interplanting a lot of these vegetables with the flowers and so I just want to leave you with that that here are some close-ups from there we combined the basil and it likes a lot of heat and so does the uh, portulaca and here are the collards Hedrick collards and German chamomile so you know we've got two German uh, species there or varieties together and here can you imagine the amount of beneficial insects that come around that chamomile with all that pollen and of course, it keeps that those collars nice and healthy. I don't see any caterpillars on there, and that was in July. Uh, here's squash, the golden zucchini, and the opal basil. But there's that little Marietta 
um, marigold, and that's to attract the bees in there, so we get really good pollination on the squash. Back to my garden, uh, edible landscaping, combining the two, you have limited areas. Um, really combining the two works beautifully. And here we've got some runner beans up that make a nice little screen between me and the street. And we have the uh, big giant 15 marigolds. And I just really enjoy, I can stop traffic by putting in a lot of the old heirlooms out front. Uh, people just, oh, my grandmother grew those. Oh, where did you get the seeds? It's just an amazing way to be part of the community. So speaking of community, i like to leave you with this uh, beautiful photo of uh, David Cavaniero took of the Indian corns. We as a culture look at Indian corn. It's about that time of year, and we put it up for decoration. But we don't really understand the profound philosophy behind that. Native Americans, when they grew their corn, you notice they're not uniform and they're not all one color. And why was that? That was the insurance policy, the safety net for the tribe. So if we have all different kinds of corn being grown at the same time and they cross-pollinate, what happens? Well, if one year we have a very bad drought and we don't have enough rain, a few of the ears will still make it through because they have the genes from the drought tolerant ones in it. And no, you won't get the whole same amount that you would ordinarily get. Again, if it's really rainy, you won't. Or if you have a disease problem. But you won't starve to death. We as a culture should have learned that because in the 19, I think it was 1990s, we had a terrible corn blight in the southeast. And a lot of it was because they were only growing two varieties of corn for most of the states down there. And they lost huge amounts of it. So now they went back to the drawing board, and they now have resistance to that. But something else is going to come along. And now when we have climate change, and the climate's changing year to year, you want more uh, resiliency. You want a bigger gene pool. And so this is, you know, the seed savers, that's what we're working on. Because you're listening to this, obviously you're interested. But now the next time you look at Indian corn, think of it in a different way. And think of it as how much it represents that the American culture was based on a lot of give and take with the, the climate, with adaptability, and with resilience. And that's what we need to build more of it in. Here's my front yard again. I've combined the old heirloom cosmos with the old heirloom apple tree there with modern um, blueberries and some uh, wonderful peanuts. We can use all the, most of those old big flowers, not only good for pollen, of course, but most of them are great cutting flowers. No, they don't last two weeks in the vase, but who cares? I love changing it out all the time anyway. I like to have different flowers in the house a couple of times a week. So that's, to me, that's not a down, that's an up. You know, another excuse to take the flowers out of the vase. And remember those antioxidants, all those heirlooms with all the different colors and the different vegetables and the fruits. We have a lot richer nutrition, uh, and that's why we want to work more and more of this into our gardens, into our, real, into our lives. And as people interested in seed saving, I thank you for saving these treasures for the next generation. And I think that Grant has a couple of questions that have been sent in, so uh, 